Well, we have been reporting today on two major political stories. Congressman George Santos is in federal court today facing criminal charges. It's part of an investigation by the Justice Department. Additionally, former President Trump was uh, found liable of sexually abusing E. Jean Carroll in a dressing room in the 1990s during a civil trial that wrapped up yesterday. To break down both of these cases, uh, let's speak to former Manhattan District Attorney Jeremy Saland. Jeremy, thank you so much for being here. Uh, let's talk about the Trump case first. Uh, it was a quick verdict. The jury only deliberated for a couple of hours. What does that tell you? It tells me that the evidence was strong. And remember, it's a preponderance of the evidence. This is a civil matter. It's not the criminal proof beyond a reasonable doubt. But the jury wasn't hoodwinked by any defense. They firmly believed that something happened, whether it was rape or sexual abuse. They believed that the evidence supported that finding. They found, that, though, that the evidence didn't support a, a rape, uh, the rape accusation, but did find uh, him liable for sexual abuse. Talk about the difference in wording there. So a rape is generally the intercourse, the sexual intercourse, whereas the sexual abuse may be some sort of touching or penetration, but not in the manner of a sexual intercourse. So it's not necessarily lesser. And I understand from listening to Joe Tacopina and, and Trump's camp that this is almost as if it's a moral victory for them, which is a weird thing to say because they're arguing this has been a rape allegation all along. This doesn't exonerate him. It's a finding of another type of sexual misconduct. But he was ordered to pay $5 million. Could the, the monetary damage have been more if, if he was found liable for rape? It's, it's the, the, the sexual abuse and the battery, that's the issue. Mm -hmm. It can come in different forms. Gotcha. And then there's separately the defamation. So Trump came out with a statement yesterday and said he was never going to get a, a, a fair trial in Manhattan because this is a liberal area. The judge, he said, was out to get him from the start. Uh, what do you make of that? It doesn't shock me that this is the same mantra we hear. It's the same drumbeat no matter where I go. Uh, I certainly, one would argue that if it was in a more left-leaning area, it would be a lot more difficult, especially in New York. But you have a jury. You have a jury pool, you have attorneys, and you have a judge who are going to ask the questions before they impanel them. So he, he had a fair opportunity. Well, uh, he did say that he is going to appeal this. So, uh, you know, where does this case now go from here? And, and, and he doesn't have to write a check to E. Jean Carroll right away. Not today. And, and by the way, nothing stops him from coming to an agreement anytime in between that's even less than that $5 million. But I use the term appeal generically. There's things and there's motions to be made immediately challenging the, jury, the jury's decision. And then there's an appeal in a more formal sense to challenge the judge's actions, for example, allowing in the testimony of the other women about what occurred to them. So there's different meanings of appeals, but this could take certainly could take a good year. Okay, still done. to watch more with that case. Uh, in the case of George Santos, now facing criminal charges today, an indictment was unsealed. He faces 13 charges, including wire fraud, money laundering, theft of public funds, and making false statements to Congress. Uh, this is uh, these are some serious allegations here. Yeah, as I always say with these cases, remember, these, the presumption of innocence. That being said, this is not a shock to anybody. I think a lot of people have expected this and potentially even more crimes of what he ultimately faces and where this goes, if it's superseded, that's yet to be seen. What about uh, the types of penalties for these kinds of charges? It's far too early to say he will get sentenced to X. It's very difficult. There are guidelines, but the judges can deviate and downward go downward from those guidelines. So yes, the maximum on some of these offenses is 20 years or 10 years, but you're looking at something far, far less in the end. The dollar amount is not the millions of dollars, it's the tens of thousands of dollars. Maybe there was something for maybe six figures, but I believe it was $24,000 in stolen monies. So the dollar amount, which usually dictates, is fairly small. And one of the one of the parts of this that I think a lot of people are finding disturbing after all of this was unsealed today uh, was the fact that he was accepting unemployment benefits uh, during COVID at a time where he actually, uh, prosecutors say, had a job. Yeah, th this is not necessarily that difficult. F follow the money, follow the pay follow the, the the written paperwork. It speaks for itself. It's pretty simple. He was unemployed. Yes or no. And he collected those monies and signed off, yes or no. It's fairly simple and straightforward. All right, Jeremy, thank you so much for all of that insight. Two stories that we will continue to follow right here on New York One.